Yeah, hello, uh, and welcome to all of you. Um, I'm happy to see so much people today. We are talking about the lean culture, something I've worked for in within 20 years almost, and uh, within this I have met Glenn Ballard, who became a good friend for me, uh, and he will tell you about lean and what's in lean for Rumble, I think, what, so you can see the ideas of it. Um, but I will let uh, Glenn introduce himself, so please welcome Glenn. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, pleased to see so many uh, interesting and interested looking faces. This is good. Um, uh, before I start, I'd just like to uh, give you kind of the rules of combat, if you will. And uh, some people don't like to be interrupted. I do. Okay. But in the interest of time, I also have, I want to get something out and then I'm, I'm going to try to deliver a pre the presentation in about half the available 90 minutes, maybe 50 minutes, but most of the time or a bunch of the time will be left for discussion. And that's, of course, where it's the most interesting. Yep. Uh, but if you have a question during my presentation that you need to have answered in order to keep listening, <laughs> ask it. <laughs> Otherwise, you drop off, right? And that's not any good for you, and I don't get a chance to talk to you. So, will you do that? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, let's go. Okay. Huh. Okay, so um, I'm talking about lean in the construction industry, but I thought it would be reasonable to start by talking about lean Without, uh, without specification, just to make sure we understand what it is, right? And uh, over time, I've come to believe that it's a fundamental philosophy of managing human organizations. Perhaps not the family, right? But human organizations that have some uh, explicit purpose, right? To do something in the world, right? And so in my mind, my way of thinking, when I talk about my, uh, my laboratory, for example, Project Production Systems Laboratory, when I think of production, it's designing and making things, right? And in projects, we design and make things that haven't been designed or made before, right? And so that's why, that's my interest. So let's, uh, but, so I've, I think of it as a fundamental philosophy, but how do you specify a philosophy? And I propose to do that in terms of the ideal pursued, the principles followed in that pursuit, and the methods employed to apply the principles. Okay? Ideal principles methods. Okay? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, <clears throat> first, the ideal. Oh. I'm going to have to do this first. So the lean ideal, you will, in the literature you'll see different uh, formulations of it, but they all amount to about the same thing. To give customers internal and external exactly what they need to accomplish their purposes with no waste. Huh? Okay, and that's of course an ideal like, uh, that can, like Lon Don Quixote's impossible dream. And we can always get closer to it but we can never finish the job. There will always be more value to generate for customers and the world, and there's always opportunity for waste reduction. But let me talk about who's the customer, what's value, and what's waste, so that we understand the definition. Okay. So I think of a customer and customer value. Customer is, first and foremost, the next person after you in a process that you're both involved in, okay? So if you do something and give it to him, and he does something and gives it to him, and it might even be go back around, right? Then he's your customer and you're his customer, yeah? And that's a very good way to think about the whole application of lean. 
But of course, it spins up. There's the paying customer, and if we live in the world of projects, they are paying customers whose um, needs and wants are really critical, right, in determining project success. There are other stakeholders besides the paying customer, maybe even within the client organization, right, like users, right, uh, like finance, right, they may not even be the same. So they may have a client representative, but that client is typically multi-headed. I think that's your experience, I'm sure, right? And we have to manage the whole client, not just the immediate client, right? Yeah. And that's not always so easy. Uh, but then after that, we have other stakeholders who may not even be within the client organization, a neighborhood association, a um, city review planning review board right, that goes on. Right? <laughs> And we have to, first of all, kind of sift them into those we have to defend ourselves against and those we can bring on side, right? Yeah. And <coughs> I think it spins up all the way to the planet. When we think, we think of Mother Earth, right? Who's more a better qualified customer than Mother Earth, right? I thought about talking about it as the species, but I think if we just talk about the human species, we may sacrifice everybody else, <laughs> right? And we are in threat of doing that, <laughs> right? So I think of the customer, uh, there we have a big set of customers in our industry and in our disciplines. Engineers, architects have um, legal responsibilities, right, to many of these customers. And I think we have ethical responsibilities to the planet. Yeah. So, find my way. Okay, so value in the lean ideal is, I think, is really quite simple. That has value for customers, which enables them to achieve their objectives. We're providing them means to their ends. And of course, that implies that if we really want to do a good job for a customer, whether it's the immediate customer or the paying customer, right, or on up, we have to understand what's their purposes. And we have to be careful not to take at, at face value what they tell us as the means to their ends. That's our job, right, is to help them, advise them, hopefully in the position of trusted advisor, advise them how to choose means to their ends, right? So then, waste is anything with a cost of any kind. The cost could be financial, it could be stress, it could be detriment to the to environment, whatever it is, a cost of any kind that can be eliminated without reducing value delivered. Yeah. I've noticed that no one has asked me a question, <laughs> but you're welcome to. Okay, then principles. Principles are, are rules of behavior, right? How do we're to act in the world? And these are not necessarily the only ones. Obviously, they aren't. They're a subset of the Toyota Way principles, right? But I, I picked them thinking that they might well be candidates for being universal. So just give them a glance and think about either whether your company subscribes to these principles or if you think they should. Yes, no? Yeah? Okay. But whether these are the right ones for your company or not, you should be having some. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think they need to be at this level of gravitas, if you will. Right? Okay. 
So, but we live in this kind of a world. So we're not Toyota, we don't make cars, we in fact don't make, uh, we don't make any, well, there may be exceptions to this, but I doubt that we make, design and make anything that is fully, the design of which is fully copied again. There may be some minor differences, with, even though location can be a major difference, right? But say it could be location, because with location comes meteorological conditions, social conditions, right? All kinds of ob uh, all kinds of implications that matter, even if you l think you're doing the same thing. And I was with Bechtel many years ago, and uh, we tried doing uh, model power plants. And we were somewhat successful, but finally, it did, and all, well, I could, maybe I should use a more nearer in time example. Intel's uh, design exact, copy exact programs. Anyone worked with Intel? Well, they have a copy exact program, and they never copy exact. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I've been there. <laughs> Kaiser Permanente is one of the big healthcare companies in the United States. I'm a Kaiser member, right? Uh, have been for a long time, and they're an excellent organization. They also have something they, I don't think they call it copy exact, but it has the same intent. But they don't do any hospital exactly the same, right? Just go look. So. So, but that's not a bad thing. We produce unique products because we're producing value in unique situations, right? And so that's part of what makes our job interesting, right? Your job interesting, okay? So this is from the Terminal 5 project at Heathrow Airport. This is underneath the main terminal building. The two holes in the wall there are two rail systems that are terminating under the, under the building. And, uh, I lived in London for three years working on this one. So. Uh, this is just a schematic I developed some years ago to try and just get a grip on, well, because I was at the time trying to figure out how to translate lean from the world of manufacturing into the world of projects, right? specifically construction projects. And so this looks in some ways very like a traditional way of thinking about a project, and it's not entirely different, but I wanted to uh, show them in phases. These are more or less the traditional phases, definition, design, supply, assembly, and use. But I wanted to show a couple of things. I wanted to show that there's this iterative link between the different phases, right? And so I wanted to be able to go back when necessary, but not only when necessary, right, when it's value adding. I also wanted to indicate that it covers the whole life cycle of the, of the product, right? So we're looking, I feel like we're responsible directly or indirectly for the life of a, of, it's like having a child. As a parent of a child, you never get divorced, right? And so I'd like to have more responsibility. No, no, I don't, no, I take that back. <laughs> I'd like to have more influence over my child, right? And stay connected over her life. Uh, and I wonder if we couldn't do a better job of that with our products, with our children. Uh, so. <clears throat> so here's a, um, uh, I think it's a, one of the best examples of almost a, almost a graphical argument, right? And the argument that I see it making is that the natural target for built environment projects is net benefits in use, right? So and this, this, is, this was a, from a study done for the National Health Service in the UK uh, some years ago, 1998. And what it shows in this big bubble on the right, I shouldn't walk in front of the camera, sorry. I was schooled about that. Is the benefits to the healthcare company, right? And met most of these benefits are benefits in use, right? So if these are all costs on the left-hand side, the size in value of this has to be greater than the sum of costs in that in order for it to be an economically viable investment. Yeah. Okay. And the numbers mean 
if you set the construction cost at one, design might be a 0.1, roughly. It's not a calculus, it's a schematic, right? In 20 years of operations and maintenance, Evans and, and company proposed that you'd, it'd be about a 4.3, so more than four times the capital or first cost. In the same 20 years in delivering the business, uh, using it to deliver health care, it'd be a 42, an order of magnitude different. Right? So I think it's an argument that net benefits and use are the natural target, and it raises some questions about where you would want to economize on cost. And you may think I'm saying this just because you're designers, but I'm not. <laughs> but it it's, it's, first of all, it's mathematically stupid to try and reduce, to get savings out of 0.1, right? <laughs> and the second one is even more stupid because this is where value gets generated, right? If you're doing what the client actually needs, right? So, ah. Enough said. But, but I would say that if you go back to the lean ideal, deliver what's needed, what's wanted by the client, enabling them to accomplish their purposes, that's this big bubble, right? And do that with no waste. Waste being anything with a cost that can be eliminated without reducing value delivered. That's what net benefits and use are. Right, so that is the lean ideal. So, um, I'm not sure what your acquaintance with lean is, but for those who got acquainted with it coming out of manufacturing, they have often been heard to say, and I hear this from lean consultants with a manufacturing background, is that lean is all about reducing waste because the value proposition has already been generated, right? They know the product design, they're just trying to make more copies of it. But that's not our project situation. Right? Okay, I'm gonna give an example of what can be done to move us in that, to in the pursuit of the lean ideal. So this is, is from manufacturing, and it's uh, from, uh, I've forgotten which book it's from, but it doesn't matter. At any rate, when uh, Toyota was uh, developing their, they were trying to get into the luxury car segment, and so they did that with their Lexus brand, right? And <coughs> they knew they had done uh, performance benchmarking against all their major competitors, most of them German. Right? And they, so for acceleration and speed and fuel economy and performance and look and all that. And they, uh, Suzuki was the chief engineer for that development project. So this is prior to production, right? It's actually designing the product. And so he said to his team, he said, look, we can't be just as good as they are. We have to be better in every dimension or we'll never get into the market. Right? and these guys are pretty good, we've got to be even better. Right? So he developed what he called his YETS. I want a car, we must produce a car with great high speed handling and stability, yet a pleasant ride. Fast and smooth ride, yet low fuel consumption. Super quiet, yet lightweight. Elegant styling, yet great aerodynamics. Warm psychological feeling, yet functional interior. Great stability at high speed, low aerodynamic friction. So what do you see in his yet's? Anyone? I mean, let me give you one. Go ahead. 
Maybe we could, could we have the mic? Because we're taping this. Oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. It, we, uh, it's a little it. light with mic on it on the upper collar. Always if it's on, it's working. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, I mean, elegant, elegant styling is, is, is not possible to, to, to discuss because it's different for every human. And then he goes to aerodynamic twice. Is it on? Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, he's talking about aerodynamic twice, great, great and low. And then he talks about fuel consumption. It's almost like he's saying the same thing the whole way down. Mm. Uh, that's just my opinion. Okay. You asked me to say something. That's okay. I took, I know my risks. I know my risks. <laughs> well, let me just take one. I'm not disputing that, but let me take one example. Um, super quiet and lightweight. So this is referring to uh, uh, vehicle induced noise, right? So it's not noise from outside so much as it is what the, the noise of the operating of the vehicle. And at that time, and that's essentially uh, caused by vibration, right? At that time, the accepted solution was mass. How does that fit with lightweight? Eh, right? And that's true for every one of these contradictions, right? And so basically what he's doing is saying, currently best practice, current best practice in all of these dimensions is not good enough. We have to invent our way beyond it, right? And so what he did with this uh, weight thing was he went back to the powertrain guys, which is the engine and transmission are the basic sources of vibration. And he finally persuaded them because he didn't have direct control over them. He didn't have hierarchical authority, but it was an important project, right? and persuaded them to redesign the engine to much closer tolerances to reduce vibration. Huh? And this whole approach is a, is a, is, um, a species of uh, imposing artificial necessity on you as an organization, a project team or a whole company, and having the discipline to act as if it were exposed by God. That's lean. If you can't do that, you, re you should want to, <laughs> right? Okay. All right. So remembering our bubble diagram, and oh, and there was a, uh, there was a famous uh, engineer, Taichi Ono, who's apparently not a very nice person, but was very effective at what he did. Uh, he yelled a lot, I think. <clears throat> but he was one of the chief architects of the Toyota production system, so the, the building side of things. And he came up with the expression, we must lower the river to redo, re reveal the rocks. And, uh, I think what he meant by that was we have to learn how to impose artificial necessity, right? And we can do that in terms of, in our world, the project world, by targeting delivery of greater net benefits. And if we can get, be smart enough to get smart enough clients or make them smarter, that will be a great selling device, right? Because that will shift the attention from first cost to life cycle cost. And that's where innovation can really make a difference. And that can be done by increasing benefits and or decreasing cost. If you're dealing with a client who absolutely has no more money to spend, right, you may be able to, to generate innovations that are, can be in, implemented and increase benefits in use even within your original budget, right? The amount of money that's allowable to spend. But in some cases, they may not be able to spend more than that. But you need to know which customer you're working for. Because right? you can save yourself some aggravation. Okay, this is an example of doing, of, of setting a target based upon uh, expected benefits 
And this is a medical office building for Sutter Health in California. It was completed in 2006, but reported in 2009, and, or 2000, yeah, 2006, I believe. And what they did was they said they were using uh, what was called target value delivery. So the idea is to set, to try and figure out what the client really needs, what's their allowable cost for getting it, right? And then um, what can we do? Then understand the expected cost in the market. If you just delivered it conventionally, what would it cost them? And then do gap analysis, right? So <clears throat> this is the market cost, if you will. This is the target cost they settled on. So 22 million, the small project, 18.9 million and 17.9 million was actual, right? And that was their first such project. Oops. So you can see, I think it was about 18% below market, right? And that was, I had, a, I had Sutter Health come um, uh, talk, give a report to my laboratory, my, my research center in 2012. They had done 22 projects, uh, roughly in this size range. They were, they were practicing before the big acute care hospitals. And they reported of those 22, none had been over budget, none had been over time, all had been produced buildings fit for purpose, and they had averaged 15% below market. That persuaded Sutter Health to, to commit to incorporating this into their lean approach to delivery of the acute care hospitals. And those are just, they're just now completing, and they have been similarly successful or even more. And this, uh, I don't know how interesting this is, but one of the, one of the um, maybe the interesting thing is, is that, and I don't know if this is your experience, but <coughs> my understanding is that it is quite normal for the cost estimate of a building to increase as the number of, as the, the model grows denser. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we have the reverse phenomenon in target value delivery. It gets less as the model develops, okay, because you're steering very actively and carefully and collaboratively towards the target. The joint, it's a joint target, it's like two sides of one coin. What do they want and what's it going to cost? And so you're provoking ingenuity and innovation and design in the attempt to maintain that relationship, right? And if you ever break it, you're in trouble. Right? But this shows that they did it. Can I walk in front just once? Thank you. So this shows, <coughs> this was the savings, cost savings, because so this was the cost within the original scope. This is the additional value added, right? And this is the capital return to the treasury. They weren't really that interested in having the money back. They were really interested in getting more bang for the buck. Right. Okay, so designing to the target cost. So these are things that, this is not the complete list obviously, but uh, this has been done, and it was done in that Fairfield Medical Office building case within the context of integrated project delivery, and um, that may not be a term of art. Uh, so uh, what that involves is uh, the client signs a multi-party agreement with the architect, the engineers, the general contractor, and the specialty contractors that are critical to the success of the project. There may be some people on the outlying outside that might not be part of the risk pool. But those people um, sign up and uh, commit their profits. Their profits are what is, is at risk. The cost of work is reimbursed. But if the cost of work exceeds the target, that erodes the profit. And typically, if you can reduce the cost below target, that increases profit. Okay? All right? 
So, and one of the key approaches to that, I don't have a, yes I do, hang on, hang on, is this idea called set-based design? No, maybe I don't. Nope. I thought I did. I'm not going to stop to change the batteries. So, but right here in number four, it says follow a set-based design strategy. And this was a direct, this is a almost <coughs> direct imitation of what Toyota does, but not in manufacturing, but in product development. There was a paper published in 1995 that uh, titled uh, The Second Toyota Paradox. And the second Toyota paradox was how could they make, spend more time in development, produce more models, more design alternatives, and yet complete development projects faster and produce uh, at less cost than anybody else. And the secret was, they said, set-based design. So what they do is they use every bit of time and money within the project, not in the world, right, to generate multiple alternatives in search of a better solution. And then they evaluate those alternatives using uh, uh, st the technical stakeholders and the user stakeholders from who any of those who might be involved. So there's really little risk that you go backwards on that on that decision. Right? And there's, um, we've adapted, in the lean world, we've adapted for that purpose a method of, of evaluating and making and choosing from multiple alternatives uh, that's called choosing by advantages. And the key difference between that and other methods that you might be used to or f familiar with is that you don't weight criteria because criteria typically represent somebody's interest, and if you weight them, you're calling somebody's God ugly, and that's not a good way to start a conversation. Right? It's a good way to start a fight. <laughs> okay? So it's a method for that you assume uh, it's complex socially, right, in terms of interest, and technically in terms of alternatives, and it's a method for working your way through that forest to get to good sound decisions. So I would recommend it to you, but I'm not going to have time to teach you. Okay, not today. But the other side of it is what we might call the social. Okay? And it has these five pieces. So collaborate, really collaborate. And so remember, we're bringing the owner is an active participant in day-to-day in -day project management. Right? The architect is there. The engineer, consulting engineers are there, the general contractors there, and the and the specialty contractors are there, all in a big room, right? And they need to collaborate, and we wanted to be sure that they didn't confuse collaboration with not biting, right? Because we expect every one of those people are there because they bring something unique to the party. They have some some special knowledge that can be valuable, and if they sit on it and don't argue their, fight their corner, right, then they're not doing their job. Right? Collaborate, really collaborate. If there's not enough noise, right, there's something wrong. Right? Optimize the whole, not the part. So in the commercial terms, encourage that, right, because you're not trying to, um, the, the parties don't have independent spe fixed scopes of work but are paid based upon value delivered to the client right, within their constraints. Tightly couple learning with action so that we learn and apply the learning immediately. We don't just do lessons learned at the end of a project. Right? When we have a problem, we try to get to the root and root it out. Projects as networks of commitment. The thinking there is that we really get uh, misled, I think, by thinking of projects. Well, let me just put it this way. Sometimes you hear people say, I want you to commit to the schedule. Don't commit to schedules. You don't make promises to schedules. You make promises to human beings, right? And that's where the customer comes in. Next person in line, immediate, right? 
And so we encourage people to make commitments to one another, and those commitments are what we call planning, right? And one of the characteristics of lean is that doers plan. Doesn't mean planners, there's not a role for planners, but it's not sufficient, right? And we want those plans to be expressed ultimately in the form of promises. You can count on me to complete this that you need for your work next week, right? And the moment I lose confidence I can keep my promise, I raise my hand to that person and to the team because it may have implications beyond that individual. And then I get help from everybody, right? And if we can't fix it, at least we have earliest warning that we need to replan. Yeah. So networks of commitment. And those are much more important to the project than the logic networks embedded in CPM schedules. Then increase relatedness. And this is a, a Chinese friend of mine who's a really good architect and project manager always said, we need to eat together. Yeah? Because that gives you, you're put into a different kind of a situation where you get to know each other as individuals. Right? And so you establish, you break down the, the relationship. It moves from being one of this position holder to that position holder, mechanical contractor to mechanical engineer, right, to one of person to person. And it makes it much easier to make promises because you see them as a person. Right? But it makes it much more awkward to break it without doing something about it. Right? We, always we do break our promises, even when we don't. We make them seriously, carefully, right? The world is complex, and it's shifting around. But we feel bad about it, and we try and figure out how to avoid repeating it. Yeah. So that's the social side. So here, this is a list. I won't read you the list. This perhaps to emphasize a point uh, already made, I think, but perhaps obliquely, we want money to be able to move easily across organizational boundaries in order to fund and to, and to better advance the project, right? So in some of those innovations will occur within disciplines, but many of the fundamental and most important innovations happen across disciplines, right? Where some change that I make in an electrical design impacts structure, impacts mechanical, right? So, so we, that's one of our indices of are we collaborating, right? Are we actually moving, because it's not just talking, it's actually changing how we invest our funds. Right? And then basics, which I think you will recognize But maybe the most important one here to take away is do not design, then cost. Do not design, then cost. You've got to learn to do it the other way around. Right? Because otherwise, you don't have the constraints you need in order to deliver value to your customer. Right? And that's one of their key constraints. No one's interrupted me. I just really wonder about this. This can't be true. I mean, but you haven't had a question that's burning you up. No? How am I doing? Are you, am I, are you finding anything interesting in this? Yes? Keep talking? <laughs> okay. Quit asking questions. Keep talking. Did I say that? <laughs> oh, Pernilla said that. Oh, Pernilla. Mm. Okay, so target value delivery is one of the big lean methods. It's a, obviously a complex method. It has lots of different elements and parts, but it's a system, if you will, and the parts are interdependent, right, in order to get what you want, to make it effective. I have time to do one more method. What do we got till... Uh, 
3.30? Okay, so just perfect. So one other method is called the last planner system, and this is something I developed in the beginning in the early 90s, um, actually before I knew about lean, but based upon my experience in the industry. And <clears throat> what, I, um, what I discovered was, uh, it was an, I was working as a consultant on a form with a former employer, Brown and Root, on the design of a paper machine for Georgia Pacific. Um, and um, I noticed something really weird in the schedule, uh, in, the, in, the, in the project, and that was no, there was no zero, zero, right? If you did Venn diagrams, right, you would expect there to be some overlap between what was supposed to be happening and what was. Well, there was no connection, right? And so this puzzled me. And uh, <coughs> I brought together the disciplined leads for that project, electrical, mechanical, et cetera, et cetera. And I, start, I just started talking with them about that. And uh, ultimately, I thought to ask, well, what percentage of plan tasks do you actually complete in a week? Now, what, what percentage of tasks that you plan to complete in a week do you complete? And there was a range of answers. Some people said 30%, and another guy said, oh, no, it's not that low. I do 70%. Well, no, it's not that high, My, right? <laughs> and they, they didn't have data, but they had impressions. And so it was, um, it ranged between 30 and 70%, I think is what they told me. But that interested me, right? Because you would think that there's kind of a, um, a, a assumption loose in the world that planning can be perfect, right? And uh, this seemed to be contradictory to that. <laughs> right? So I, I've, I subsequently measured it. I measured it in design, I measured it in construction, I measured it in the United States, I measured it in Venezuela. I'm in, you know, I've got a pretty good data set at this point. And what I found was that on average, the, uh, the, fir the starting in nature found um, measurement metric is 54%. So about 54% of tasks that are scheduled actually plan to be done, right, get done. And that struck me as important. I didn't know immediately why it was so important, but it just seems like an odd thing, first of all, right? Yeah. Okay. But then I started thinking about, well, in terms of this reliable promising, if I'm about a coin flip reliable and you depend on me for something, you know, you, I'm asking you to believe what I'm telling you I'm going to do, and I'm 54% reliable, how does that impact, how does that affect your behavior? You can tell me. He doesn't know. Well, I think I do, so <laughs> I'll tell you. I think my guess is that what happens is that people don't go very long, if that's a recurrent situation, in investing significant time in planning and preparation for performing a task that they think is only a coin flip likely. But you start moving into a strategy of flexibility. You say, well, I need to be prepared to take advantage of whatever opportunity appears to use my capacity. I'm, I'm a foreman or a squad boss, or, right? right? I've got this obligation here. I've got cost obligation. I've got to use my, my hours to the best, best use, right? But you're not determining, in many cases, what's available to you. You're a part of a chain, multiple chains, right? And the predictability of flow in that chain is what brings, right? Yeah. And if that's highly unpredictable, my guess is that people stop planning. Now, that'll vary with individuals, of course, but I think that overall, that's a good bet. Yeah. And so what we find here is a, a fundamental characteristic of our project's behavior that helps explain why the productivity in our industry is about where it was 30 years ago. Uh, I don't entirely believe that's true because I don't think it's fully adjusted for the increased complexity of the products we're designing and making, but I think it's true enough to be worried about. Right? So that, that metric I call percent plan complete, percentage of plan tasks completed. And it's a very simple metric doesn't take much calculation, doesn't take much uh, IT support, right? 
but, and it's not in the dashboard of your project manager. They have time, they have cost, they have value delivered, right, scope. But I think that workflow reliability is the variable that drives the other variables. Okay. So that's why it's important. So this is a kind of schema for this uh, so-called last planner system. And what I was, I called it last planner because I was really interested in, sh initially, my motivation was to shield the design squad boss and the construction crew foreman from the, um, from the erratic flow towards the, of demand coming towards them, stuff they could work on, right? And so the first rule I set up was only commit. So I was trying to get, it, get away from the situation. You're supposed to, what's on, what are you going to do this week? What's on the schedule? Well, you know, you can't make it up if it's not, you can make, you can pretend you've made it up, but it's just a pretense, right? So I said, let's make that, let's make this legal behavior. In fact, required behavior. Only commit to tasks that are sound. We know they can be done. They're in the right sequence, so doing them now doesn't cause a penalty later, right? Or expressed in the language of the performers, not in the language of the, the, the um, uh, accountants, right? And, um, and are sized to the cap capacity, capability of the performers, because we want to be reliable, right? And people have different capabilities. So that rule, sound, sequenced, sized, and defined, right? And if you only do that, your life will get better. Because that forces, what you're doing is you're putting in the system, in, a pro in the process, a block, which if not easily removed, puts back pressure upstream to make work ready in the right sequence and rate. And so we can't just have our attention focused here and expect to manage a project. We've got to be managing the future of what happens here, right? And there, the system is designed to do that. So this was the intervention point here and here. We're, we're not going to be perfect. We will break our promises. Let's figure out why and prevent, prevent it happening again. Look ahead planning was in, implemented in order to have a systematic way of making task, scheduled tasks ready to be performed so that we can see our future coming towards us and shape it, right, okay? And then phase scheduling is the level above that that would be by phase of project. It might be concept design, schematic design, et cetera, detail design, right? But where there, what the fundamental thing I wanted to do was to have the people that are going to be directly responsible for and, and are doing the work in each phase to be involved in planning how to do the work in that phase. Small questions. Um, the problem from, for me in daily work is about flow. I think it's uh, very few person who take a responsibility of your flow in our daily work here in your house and your daily work on your construction. Hmm. Could well, you I tell us something about flow in your production? Only in design. As you, who, my, my question is going about um, what is your problem? The problem for me is only a few persons who know what flow is and take mm. uh, um, responsibility about uh, flow in my work to your next customer. Okay. Well, I think, but there's, um, we do something called pull planning in phase scheduling. And it involves setting milestone, and it can be done at different levels of granularity. If it's a really big, long, complicated phase, you'd have a sub milestones, right? But you would set a milestone with a date certain, right, back there, and then work your way back to where you are now, right? Okay. And obviously, you're generating by ask, asking and answering the question: Okay, if we're going to do this by this date, what has to happen just before that? What has to happen just before that? What has to happen just before that? And so you're creating a logic network, right? So it'll go maybe two prongs out of that one and three out of this one, right? And this one just has one, right? But it wires all together. 
until you get to, there's nothing ahead of it, right? And that's when you're able to start. And what we find is that, and that teaches people about flow. And the way you populate that is through the routine of reliable promising, right? Story, tell you a story. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the 20 bucks later. Yeah. <laughs> so story, um, uh, working in the design phase of a project, I've forgotten what we were designing actually, but I, w I was facilitating the pool planning session and we couldn't get the whole damn light logic network to fit within the available time. So the, the start date was all to the wrong side of when we can start, right? Because there's other work ahead of us, right? And so we were working with the team to try to reduce the durations of the individual tasks or look for different combinations, different pathways, right? And uh, asked the electrical engineer, Rebecca, uh, I, I embarrassingly used this example the other day in a room where a guy knew Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> and he had been on the project, but at any rate. So is there anything anyone could give you or do differently, um, give you something different or give it to you differently that would allow you to reduce the time of this task, right, this sticky note on the wall, right? And uh, she said, sure. And well, what is it? So, well, if Bill could give me, I'm, I, he gives me information about electrical equipment, but it's all a jumble of invoices and stickers and stuff, and right? And it just takes time and tedious, you know, it's tedious to put that all together. And if he could just give me that on a spreadsheet with all, all the, you know, the manufacturers, amperage, platforms, right, base requirements and so forth, all laid out, you know, that would save me time. He says, have you ever asked him? Uh, no. And he, she said no, as if, who, me? Why should I ask him? Well, I think you just explained why you should ask him, <laughs> right? Because you need it, <laughs> right? So we went down the wall. Bill was down, that, down there, just a few steps away, and she repeated this desire, this request to Bill, and Bill said, sure, I didn't know you needed that. Huh? That's flow, right? We're creating flow right there. I don't think it's a very technical concept. It's a fundamental concept. And we can engage people in the process of creating their own future by doing that. Right? We're not helpless victims of fate. Okay. And right now I'm in process of extending last planner to master planning. Because I don't think that works as well as it could. And especially to consider uncertainties, uh, especially uh, of the type. In fact, in the lean literature, it tends to focus on variation um, and uncertainties that are statistically predictable. And where they are, you can model them with a frequency distribution and you can calculate a buffer. Right? of time or money or capacity or something, right? But, or, or stuff. Uh, but if it's a high impact, low probability event, a so-called black swan, that could take the project out, we don't really have a prescription for that, right? But there is a way to deal with it in what's called stochastic planning. And Last Planner incorporates one of the two primary tools in stochastic planning, which is postponement. We want to do everything that we do at the last responsible moment, not the first opportunity. Okay? So as we have better information, right? We're reducing uncertainty just with the progression of events, and we can accelerate that by being careful in our make-ready function, our look-ahead function. Right? But, the, but on the other side, there is hedging, right? And you may know hedging from options, securities options, put and call options, right? Where you're buying an opportunity to purchase or to sell uh, a stock or some type of security at a future date at, for a, at a specific price, right? That costs money, but it shields, it, it preserves your ability to choose a pathway in the future. And we can incorporate those into our schedules, our, our programs, right? 
and uh, to our benefit. But that's probably more information that you wanted to hear. So, mm -hmm. yeah. At any rate, I'm working on that. Okay, so last planner. So some presuppositions. And uh, first is production systems are both social and technical. And if we only think of them as technical, we're very, very, very wrong. I think I've made that point already. Maybe to go down here, I've also made this point. Willingness to invest in planning and preparation varies with the reliability of workflow. That is the predictable release of work from one specialist to another. Right? And so operational performance varies with planning and preparation. Planning and preparation varies with workflow reliability. Dot, 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 dot. It's, an, it's a syllogism almost. Right? So. Principles plan in greater detail as you get closer to doing the work. Produce plans collaboratively with those who will do the work. Reveal and remove constraints on plan tasks as a team because we're interdependent. Right? And different people may have different information relevant to removing constraints. Make and secure reliable promises and learn from breakdowns. So if we did those, I would suggest to you that this might be a good idea. <laughs> yeah? You don't know. All right. This is an application of Last Planner on a design project uh, back in 1998. This was a 7,000 seat enclosed amphitheater for performing arts in Dallas, Texas. And what we're tracking is, you can see um, it's divided by the meeting dates and by discipline. So this is site civil. Uh, the civil engineer, HA, was to provide the Texas uh, accessibility standards requirements to the architect, ELS, right? And they did. They were going to do it on 7798. They did it on 7798. And remember, we reversed those in the US. I don't know why. Okay? But if you go on, the next one it was supposed to be done on that same date, 71098. It slipped to 731 and then finally got done on 8-2, right? So that would be a re recorded as a, as a plan failure and reduce your percent plan complete, right? Okay? So just to show you that it can be, and has been applied in design. Just a small question. Sure. How do you do the planning then? Do you have a common meeting where you sit down and find out which information you need to yeah, we first, we started it with a face-to-face -face meeting, an all-teams meeting in one physical place. And we did, we planned the whole project, and then we planned the first part of, the, of that project in more detail, using the stickies on the wall kind of approach. And then we were, the team was uh, kind of an all-star team, so they were from all over the United States. So we couldn't all easily get together all the time. So most of these meetings were by video conference. You, you had any to say, if a meeting should be efficient, we can have mm. 10 people, 20 people. Mm. Because sometimes, you know, when you're talking with the construction, man, it's actually just a bit of the construction. He actually don't know. He may not know, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, this was all in design. This was all in the design phase. We didn't get to construction, they stopped the project. But not because of anything about the design. Just <laughs> It turned out to be a bad idea. <laughs> So we didn't really have that problem. It was really the, 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 the leads for each of the disciplines. Mm -hmm. So you have a concept for that kind of meeting, to know how to, you know, just see guys on the wall. Right, right. And there's now some technologies that um, you can use that help with that. I think the, the physical act is really important because it's a kind of a personal commitment, right? But you need, it really helps to have software because when you want to change it, <laughs> right? And, and you don't have to have all these big rolls of paper lying around all over the place. Do you have any experience I could see that, that some of the deadlines like two days out or need that information mm -hmm. to treat us out? Do you have any experience that it's better to group it? Yeah, I mean, you can group it in terms, you can, you can work it at, um, at a higher level of granularity, or lower level of granularity, more aggregated, right? And so you're, you're working at the level of the phase schedule first, and then only on certain, you know, when, you, when that, the, yeah, they, break, they go down into the look-ahead window 
typically say six weeks long. And so you're only looking at the things in detail if they're in that window. Right? And less in detail, and more in detail as you get into the last three weeks, right? the two weeks prior to execution and the last week. Yeah. Okay, and this is the PPC for that uh, team. And uh, on a two week on two week centers, and they averaged at sixty percent, and they were trying, <laughs> right? Okay, but um, um, we also measure, but I don't I don't have a graphic for this. We measured the average PPC for different groups, and the worst was management, <laughs> and the best was civil engineering. And so I asked the civil engineer to take at random five of his planned failures and do five whys analysis. And did you know, do you know that term? Okay. And so it's not a scientific method, but it's pretty, it's rough and ready and, and useful. And so, <clears throat> so he did. And here's what he found on the first one. They were going to, they were supposed to have the city or somebody, I guess the, uh, the owner, decide between three alternative pavement designs why wasn't a pavement design selected? City refused to accept any of our pavement designs. Why did they refuse to accept our pavement designs? Because we, <laughs> we had based them on inaccurate soils calculations, right? bearing calculations. And what, what actually happened there, the root cause was we assumed the soil conditions would be the same as on a nearby project. We did five and four had the same root cause assumption. And so my guess was, but based on that, and I don't, it'd be interesting to hear your reaction, is because we didn't really find a high frequency of technical errors, miscalculations, right, missizing, those kinds of things. But the fundamental problem seemed to be acting ahead of your information, outrunning your blockers. And that might have been a function of being pushed for speed. Because we know in the construction side of the business, it's the more schedule urgent you are, the more prone you are to having accidents. And defects are accidents, right, in the design space. Right. I just thought that might be interesting. Okay, if yes. there were two questions. Mm. One was, do we have some standards for making this sustainable status? Yeah. And maybe we could tell that Daniela had been lots of experience Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I think she's she's very knowledgeable about it. Right. Okay. So this was a uh, this is from a, an architectural firm in um, they're Boulder Associates out of Boulder, Colorado, but they have offices throughout the West, and uh, they have an office in Sacramento that uh, was infected by the lean bug because they worked for Sutter Health on a project. And Romano Nickerson, the head of office, uh, decided to try Last Planner. And it's a small office, I think seven people or something like that, right? But small enough that you could actually do an experiment really quickly, right? And so the colors represent individuals PPC in the first 13 weeks, right? This is the next 13 weeks. So getting much more highly consistent, right? And you can take these two weeks in March and look at how the work time was spent. And these are different projects. And this is days in the week. And this is, you may notice, the weekend. <laughs> right? So remember how those bars are, right? OK? Well, <clears throat> this is the next 13. This is two weeks in May. Right? And so they're delivering under more strenuous load conditions because they've got three submittals, a resubmittal and two initial submittals due to different clients in the same period. And they're spending less time overall and much less time in overtime. And so they're making money because a, that's a reflection of productivity and they're improving the quality of work life, which is not negligible because we burn people up, right, and trying to work beyond our, beyond our budget, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry? They're the different, uh, different 
customers. Yeah. So I'm sorry, he should have had a color, as an architect, he should have had a color code. Right? <laughs> okay. So these are just, this is conclusion, I think, and hope. So as opposed to planners plan and doers do, we want doers to plan. Uh, as opposed to the zero-sum game, we want everyone to be able to win and try to set commercial terms that way. We're trying to think of competition as not between individual companies for contracts, but between supply chains, intact teams. And these are all tendencies. We're moving in these directions, right? Uh, better looking at it than for it is something I was told as a, as a pipe fitter's helper working on construction projects. Hey boy, I'd rather be looking at it than for it, right? Meaning that they wanted to, to, to fill the parking lot with everything you needed to build a project and then empty it. Right? And that's not exactly doing things at the last responsible moment. <laughs> uh, innovation is stifled by the problem who pays, who gains, but we want to fix that. Control tends to be reactive to negative differences between did and should for time, money, everything. Right? And we think that that uh, misses a huge opportunity in terms of what we might call this is reactive control after the fact, but the uh, planet, last planner system wants to take proactive control. Let's act to make the future, to shape the future the way we want it to be and need it to be. Right? So it's steering, steering towards targets, like driving your car towards where you want to go. Right? Not looking in the rearview mirror. Right? Problems are sins, unwanted and worthy of punishment. Sinners are worthy of punishment. Right? as opposed to problems or opportunities for learning. So some big, broad generalizations about the difference between lean and traditional. I'm going to stop. Okay. We have 20 minutes. In five minutes or less, let's just do it. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to record all these, but uh, that'll be okay. Okay.